Good morning. How's everybody doing? It is a joy to be able to open God's word with you this morning and to study it together. Um, if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn them to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Go ahead and turn your Bible there and we will read from it shortly. The title of today's message is Confessions of a Satisfied Heart. And to be honest, the reason why this sermon was chosen was because I'm not there. I'm not there. And I need to get there. I need to get there to that place where God truly is this all-satisfying Savior of my soul, my one true delight, the life of everything that I could ever hope for, my all in all. And I'm not there. Who's there with me? But I want to get there. And don't you? And today's psalm is about that. How do we get to that place where we, as we will read in this psalm, cultivate a heart that is fully satisfied in the Lord, regardless of our circumstances, how easy or how difficult, how plain or how complicated they may be. Truly, the Lord wants us to have a satisfied heart in Him. So what we will discover this morning as we go over this passage, I think this is on, is number one, maybe it's not on. Maybe I can get some help back there. <laughs> well, first we'll learn about the battlefield of our hearts. And you can follow along too. There is notes in your bulletin. There's a little sheet of paper with notes that you can kind of follow along. But number one, we'll learn about the battlefield of our hearts. Number two, the surpassing worth of God. And then number three, we'll learn about the cultivation of our life. And as when we consider these principles and these realities in this psalm, that God will take us to that place of an all satisfying. Savior that he is. We will see it, we will relish in it, and life will be different. If you will, can you join me in standing as we read together Psalm 16, beginning with verse 1. These are the words from David, carried about by the Holy Spirit. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that you have not left us in the dark, you have not left us to ourselves but you have mightily and powerfully revealed yourself to us through creation, through your word, through your son, and even more through your Holy Spirit. God, we rejoice in your fellowship that you offer to us. We rejoice in the love that you pour out into us. We rejoice in knowing that you can be our Lord. And in you, we can find refuge and truly in you, I have no good apart from you. Father, take us there today. Help us to see what David sees. 
Help us to know what David, David knows. Help us to, to feel the weight of your word today, that truly your kingdom would be glorified in us and through us, and that we might know you in a more sweeter way. Bless this time as we study your word. Open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts to only you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. You may be seated. The battlefield of our hearts is the first point that we'll be learning about today. The battlefield of our heart. Yes, thank you. And that battle has been won with this at least. The battlefield of our heart, verse, chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Little to nothing is known about the background of this psalm in terms of where David was at this point in life and what was happening to him at that time. We can only gather from this passage that David must be going through some degree of difficulty or trouble such that he would immediately cry out to God, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. In other words, David is asking God to keep him and watch over him, even protect him, because God alone is his source of security, safety, and even his hiding place. For David, then, there is no other place that brings him peace, safety, protection, comfort, and even strength to keep going. That place is found only in God. Not his friends, not his job, not his home, not his family, not anything else. It's God who is his only refuge. Not only that, but we see in verse 2 that the Lord is his treasure. Notice how first David refers to God as Lord or Jehovah, you will see there. It's the covenant name that God has given to his people by which we can call on him as his special covenant people, his redeemed people for his own glory, for his own prized possession which he shared through Moses that tell them, I am has sent you, the Lord has sent you. That Lord also reminds us that God is the sovereign maker of all things, the Lord and ruler of the universe, the self-existing one before all things and over all things and to whom all things were made for, that one David is calling out to. But it doesn't end there because he says, I say to the Lord, what? You are my, my Lord. It's one thing to acknowledge God as the Lord, the supreme ruler and owner and majestic king over all creation, but it's quite another thing to know him as my Lord, my teacher, my master, my Lord, my king. And then David goes on to say, I have no good apart from you, meaning God is his supreme treasure, his highest good, whose worth is immeasurably greater than anything else and unrivaled. To say to God, I have no good apart from you, is to acknowledge that our life our mean, has meaning and significance and worth in one person alone. And who is that? Our Lord. He is Lord over all, David's saying. He is everything to me. He's my supreme treasure. He is worthy of all my worship. I am nothing without him. I count everything as loss compared to knowing him. That's what David starts with. What do we start with when we pray? What do we start with every day? Are we there? Do we see him for who he is? Do we call out to him as he is and for what he is to us? It's all about worship we're seeing and who it is that we are truly worshiping. It's no small thing then for what David is saying here, is it? 
Indeed, David is revealing the very DNA of authentic and unwavering worship of God. He's my only refuge. I place my trust entirely in him. He is Lord over all. He is everything to me. It's no coincidence that this place is also the most contested area of our heart. For from the moment we wake up, our hearts become a battlefield over who or what will occupy it and be worshipped by it. And it's a fierce battle, a battle we are actively involved in as morally responsible beings, whether we realize it or not. For God made you and me to be worshipers, and our hearts are actively and constantly searching for something to worship. If not God, guess what? It's something else. And we will prioritize our life, our wants, our desires, all around the very one we are worshiping. Why? Because God not only made us to be worshipers, but he also made us with the freedom of inclination. Meaning that you and I choose what we most want to do. We choose option A because that's more desirable and I'm inclined to that one over option B. I am inclined because of the freedom inclination that God has given you and me. And whatever owns our hearts, whatever is owning our desires, we will go that way. That's why we need Jesus to break the stronghold of sin's desires that has so corrupted our hearts. Isn't this why Jesus would warn us it is simply impossible to have two gods in our life? We see this in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 4. Number one, we see the wonder of what worship really looks like when we consider God. David cries out, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? He is in awe of the almighty God being his. And then we hear the warning in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 24, from Jesus' mouth, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. John Calvin once famously put it this way, our hearts are idol factories, meaning we will worship something constantly, whether it's us, our appearance, our prestige, our likability on social network, our friends, whatever it is, the materialistic things, we will worship that very easily in place or alongside of God because we were made to be worshipers and our hearts are a battlefield over who is occupying that worship. Does it explain what's going on in our culture, beloved? in our morally confused culture? Isn't that why we see all the protests and riots over politics and racism that has been reoccurring so much? Or the sexual and gender revolution that is sweeping our nation? Or the self-entitlement and um, autonomous ideology that is so pervasive? There is a lot more going on than mere racial issues, than mere social justice issues and one's own personal rights in life. What's going on? It's a theological issue. It's a heart issue. It's a worship issue. And doesn't this explain, beloved, why we struggle in our homes, in our own personal lives? Because there's a battle raging in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, our heart is a battlefield and the very center of that battle is the underlying question, who are we worshiping? Is it God? Is everything I do, I think, and I feel motivated by an unquenchable thirst to glorify God because he's my only good and he is worthy of all my affections and praise? Or is it something else there? 
May God so expose the wanderings of our heart and effectually lead all our affections back to him so that we may join David in saying, apart from God, I have no good. May he bring us there and protect us and preserve us there so that he alone is hailed as the almighty king and Lord of our lives. There's a battlefield in our heart in this passage. But notice, secondly, we, we learn about the surpassing worth of God. For the remainder of this passage, verses um, 3 through 11, we learn about what it is that compels David to have that place in his heart where he can honestly say, I have no good apart from God. What brings him there? Well, we learn that there are at least five different things that, that helps him get there, that reinforces how God is surpassing in worth compared to everything else. Number one, we learn about the fellowship of the saints, verse three and four. Number two, we're going to see the providential care of God, verse five and six. Number three, we learn about the covenantal presence of God, verse seven and eight. Number four, we learn about the sustaining grace of God, verse 9 and 10. And then lastly, we will see the everlasting joy of God's love, verse 10 through 11. So let's start with the first one, the fellowship of the saints, verses 3 through 4. Let's read that again. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. There's something different about being among the community of believers, the, the family of God, than anywhere else, isn't there? There's something different. The love, the care, the support, the encouragement, the accountability, the transparency, the same heart for God and concern for his will and love for his word, the same outlook on life, the same companionship, and so much more. That is what makes the fellowship of God's people so sweet and so unlike any other gathering. You won't find at the Moose Lodge what you find here. You won't find in Congress what you find here. You won't find in any fraternity, any sorority, any kind of other club what you find amongst God's people. Because who's in the midst of God's people? And he makes it sweet. And it's all the work of God's redeeming power, his sovereign grace, the regenerating work that he powerfully does within us that such that we are changed that this sweet fellowship is made possible for us to enjoy. And for David, that fellowship was his total delight. Notice how he even compared his experience of and desires for the fellowship of God's people, the company to the company of those who do not treasure God, in verse 4, the stars of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. He will not engage with what they do. He won't go there. He won't associate with them or join in their folly because he knows to what destructive end that goes. It might look sweet at first, beloved. It might feel good at first, beloved but it only leads to death and destruction and to hell. There's only one who brings you the all-satisfying joy your hearts have been longing for since you were conceived. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Beloved, how grateful are we for the fellowship that we share with those who belong to God, even as we belong to God? Are we taking time to encourage one another and support one another? Are we praying honestly for one another? Are we loving and forgiving one another just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us? Are we holding one another accountable to holiness because we love each other too much to let the other die in their sin? Are we doing that? We ought to be, 
because that's the joy of sharing this fellowship with each other and with God. The fellowship of the saints demonstrate the surpassing worth of God. Second, the providential care of God demonstrates the surpassing worth of God. Verse 5 and 6. After talking about those who run after other idols, where is David going to? The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. The language David uses here again shows how precious the Lord is to David and how thankful he is that he belongs to the sovereign maker and ruler over all creation. He is my chosen portion. That's astounding. How is that possible? Indeed, the only reason David can go there and identify God as his chosen portion and as his cup is because God first graciously and freely chose David to be his, which is also true for any of us. Listen to Deuteronomy 10, verse 14 through 16. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Yet, don't miss that yet, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. He owns it all, but who's his prized possession? Is it the sheep? Is it the goats? Is it an elephant? No, it's you. He set his heart on you. You are his chosen portion. And David sees that and is amazed by that. And he goes back to God. You are my chosen portion. Indeed, the only reason David can identify God as that is because he understands God chose me first. God rescued me. When I was on my hell-bound race, God swept me up and brought me to him. David knows whose he is, and for him, belonging to the Lord is insurmountably better than anything else. Especially when considering what David says next, you hold my lot. You hold my lot. That Hebrew there, word there for lots in this context most likely refers to one's allotment or territory given to him or her as an inheritance, as determined by the will of God. Verse 6 provides a context for this understanding. In other words, to say to God, you hold my lots, is to recognize that all I have in this life whether past, present, or future, all that I'm going through, be it difficult and hard or easy and enjoyable, be it known or unknown, what I had planned or expected or what had came, come to me as a life-altering surprise and crisis, all of it rests in the sovereign and tender hands of the Almighty God who is wise, who is righteous, who is holy and is loving. And guess what? He is for you. Nothing can come upon my life without a first going through the almighty hands. Aren't you glad? He holds my lot. He holds my life. Indeed, this is precisely the sweet doctrine of God's providence, which affirms from eternity past until eternity future, God is constantly and meticulously upholding and working all things together according to his good, perfect, wise will to accomplish everything he wants, exactly the way he wants, for his glory and our good. Indeed, it has once been said, the providence of God is like a sweet pillow upon which to rest thy head. It's a sweet pillow. So rest your heavy heart, beloved, on that pillow. He holds your lot. 
Paul would say it this way in Acts chapter 17 when addressing the crowd there in verses 24 through 26. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Why? That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. He holds our lot. In other words, David can say in verse 6, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance because I know who holds it all. He is in control. And he is for me. He's not against me. He's working all things together for my good and for his glory. His hands hold my life. The very one who saved me is working all things together. He is for me and holds me. Brothers and sisters, the providential care of God is like a sweet pillow upon which to rest our head. And it further proves why I can agree with David that apart from God, I have no good. I have no good apart from God. For what rest, what comfort, what peace, what hope, what strength, what joy, what faith, what contentment, what assurance we can experience when we embrace the providential care of God. Truly, God is worthy of all our adoration and trust. Third, the covenantal presence of God reminds us of God's surpassing worth. Look at verses 7 and 8. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night my heart also instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. He gives me counsel. He is at my right hand. This is simply astounding to consider, especially when we acknowledge him as a sovereign Lord of the universe who is far beyond us, yet comes near to us, so near to us that he hears us every time we call to him, so close to us that he holds our hands, even in the darkest valleys. Aren't you thankful we have a God who comes that near to us? He even gives his Holy Spirit to us, our counselor, our comforter, to guide us in all truth. Aren't you glad that God is always with us, constantly guiding, upholding, and protecting, even as Psalm 23 so beautifully explains for us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What do we have to fear, beloved? I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know it seems, what the heck is going on here sometimes? But behold, your God is with you. He holds your lot. He walks before you. And it doesn't stop there. Fourth, the sustaining grace of God reminds David of his surpassing worth. Verses 9 and 10. Look at that with me. Therefore, you just kind of feel this, this, this overwhelming, overwhelming cultivation of just just joy and gladness and adoration and just pure, just amazement in God as he begins at verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Why? Verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Too thankful 
that he who began the good work in you will be faithful to what? Complete it on that day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verse 6. In other words, the redemptive work that our sovereign God initiated in us, even as he first set his love on us before we even knew him, and then he drew us to himself, convicted us of our sins and our need for salvation, and then he gave us faith to believe and to run to Christ. That redemptive work that he began, he continued continues and is doing until the day he brings you to glory. He will not abandon you. He will not just stop short of saving you. He is through and through going to bring you to his glory forever. In other words, it's not dependent on me entirely, but I join him in that saving work as I work out my salvation with fear, trusting and embracing Jesus as my only hope, my only joy, my only treasure, my only all and all. What peace, what comfort, what blessed assurance, what joy, what security this ought to bring our souls when we consider God won't abandon us to hell. We don't need to fear, beloved, that somehow we're going to mess up or that somehow it's just a matter of time. If I have messed up this number of times, God's going to pull me into his office. He's going to say, Mike, how do you think things are going? And I'm going to say, well, God, you know, it's been a journey. I think I'm doing well. I think there's room for improvement. I'm not that efficient at this job yet, but I know I can get better. And then God just suddenly say, I don't, Mike. I don't think it's going to get any better. In fact, I'm laying you off. You got a week of pay. You got your severance check. You got your benefits till the end of the month. And so long, good luck. God is not that. And even if we might someday experience that personally with our own boss, we will never experience that with our holy, loving, sovereign Father in heaven. He keeps you till the end. And we can trust him for that. But how do we know we can trust him? And what gives us that assurance that we can know for sure that he won't abandon us, that his saving work is enough? How do we know? Well, take a look at verse 10, especially the, the latter part of verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Beloved, verse 10 points to why you can trust God. Verse 10 points to the only one who will ever and fully satisfy your soul. Verse 10 points to the one who magnificently displays the surpassing worth of God. Well, who is it about then? It is about Jesus Christ. Verse 10 points to the one that would come after David, whom God spoke of long ago because he has planned since eternity past to be the means for the salvation and, this, and the blessed assurance we have. He has planned for Jesus to be that means. And the apostle Paul got that. And we have the assurance of that in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 to 39. Listen to what Paul recognizes as he is speaking to the crowd. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to our fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption or to decay, that word. He has spoken this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep. He died and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But, and that's a glorious but, he whom God raised up did not see corruption. 
Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes in him is freed from everything from which you could not be freed from the law of Moses. Praise God. You can have the assurance that you desperately need and long for and are fighting for every day with your own strength, through your own solutions. Put them off and come to Christ. He is the one that will give you the assurance that your soul needs. He is the only one that can save us from our guilt and from our sin. He is the only one who can give us new life and new hearts. He is the only one that can make us right with God. And your soul will be satisfied in him. Have you come to the waters? Have you drunk of his salvation? Have you taken of his body? Have you seen his cross and said, that's for me? Beloved, if you don't know what it feels like to have the burden of your sin removed and the guilt of that, then I would urge you to consider maybe you've never had it taken off yet because you haven't come to Christ yet. And the invitation is for you today. Come to Christ. Believe in him. Know him as your Lord and Savior. He has come to give you the forgiveness and to take that weight off of you. Believe in him. Come to him. He's here for you. And the resurrection of Christ proves that he is God's answer for you. And David saw that even in Psalm 16, verse 10. Praise God for his sustaining grace that preserves us and that keeps us and has been made available through Jesus. Fifth and finally, what we learn about here about God's surpassing worth is the everlasting joy of God's love. Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God doesn't have to make known to us the path of life. And yet he freely and powerfully does such that it effectually awakens our soul and opens our blind eyes to see our sin problem and our dire need for a Savior, the only one God himself could provide, Jesus. He makes known to us Our hearts became known to the path of life. God made known the path of life to you. Have you thought of that before? The only reason why you and I can believe in God is because he made known the path of life to us. He drew us to himself, and our soul said, yes, 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 Jesus, I need you. I come to you. Aren't you thankful that God makes known to you the path of life? And not only that, but he keeps making known to us the path of life through his word, that we can indeed know him more closely and walk according to his ways because he has revealed himself through his word. Aren't you thankful that God saved our soul when I was, we were lost in our sin, miserable in our wretched ways, yet knew not how to save myself? I was in the dark, and then God came in and made known to me the path of life, Jesus. And this path of life is one that will be marked with fullness of joy, we read in verse 11, and pleasures forevermore. And I know it doesn't feel like that all the time. In fact, sometimes this life feels more like a heartache than a joy. And every day is certainly not a Friday, but there's a day coming. There is a day coming. When all the sorrows, all the pains, all the sufferings, all of this momentary light affliction will be exchanged for a far weightier glory. We get to be in the presence of God. Fullness of joy forevermore. Beloved, stop going to other sources for joy and come to the one who fully satisfies. You have people you know who are going to other sources for joy Bring them to Christ. They need to know where true joy comes from. This place is not our home. We have a better home. We have a lasting home. And we can get through this because who's with us and who's bringing us and who do we get to be with 
forever. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the surpassing worth of God. And lastly, what we learn about in this passage, and real briefly, the cultivation of our life. It's not enough to recite this psalm to produce in us the real and abiding satisfaction of the Lord that we see David is testifying to. Nor is it enough just to occasionally think about these verses or to have them written on the wall. Rather, God makes it very plain to us that we need to join him in being proactive in this battle for our heart and what we know about God's surpassing worth. He's given us what we can, what we can cultivate in us in this word. And there are at least six different ways that we can cultivate a life that will, that will return in a joy where we will say with David, I have no good apart from God. Number one, know Jesus personally. To get to that place, you've got to know Jesus. He alone can give you lasting and real joy. Second, treasure Jesus above all else by pursuing holiness and by putting to death the old nature in our life. Things that only try to destroy you. Instead, pursue that which will only bring you closer to God. Third, fellowship and worship with God's people as God has given each of us to help one another out in this walk of faith. Fourth, spend regular time, quality time in God's word and prayer so that his word will instruct you even in the night that we read about in verse 7. Fifth, set the Lord sometimes before you, you know, Sunday morning before you, uh, Sunday night before you. No, always before you. Set the Lord always before you, being resolved to take every thought captive, every choice, every feeling, every desire, every action, take it captive. Is it glorifying God? And six, be heavenly focused. This is not my home. Better things are to come. And my God has made that secure. Nothing can take that away. We learned today in the confessions of the satisfied heart about the battlefield of our heart, the surpassing worth of our God, the cultivation of our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are so good that no matter what we experience in this life, we have you and nothing can take that away from us. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. You are my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. Indeed, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance that you are keeping for me and that you will take me to. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, my heart also instructs me. I have set the Lord. Oh, God, help us to always set you before us. And because you are our right hand, I will never need to be shaken. Help me to remember that, God, in the darkest valleys, you are at my right hand. You hold my lot. You are not letting go. Therefore, my heart rejoices. And my heart, my heart is glad. For you will not allow, you will not let your beloved, you will not let my soul go to Sheol. You will not abandon me. You will take me to glory. And nothing, nothing can take me out of your hands. Not death, not fears, not anything in this world. I am sovereignly kept by your grace. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God, I thank you for making known to me the path of life. Oh, God, keep us, preserve us, oh, God, for in you we take refuge. Lead us not astray, but keep us on the path, the path of life. And, oh, God, use us 
Oh God, use us for those who aren't on that path. Set up those appointments and use us as signs, use us as guides, use us, Lord, as instruments so that they too might know the path of life and be saved in Christ. Because it is in him I have this blessed assurance. Thank you for our all-satisfying Savior. Thank you that in anything and every circumstance, you have given me such sweet satisfaction. There is no good apart from you. In Jesus' name, amen.